the stage David Carter, former NFL player. He is now undertaking the next journey of his life, promoting the vegan lifestyle. All right, so my name is David Carter, also known as 300 pound vegan, even though I'm clearly not 300 pounds anymore, I'm like 250, you know, hanging in there, no. But I'm retired now, so it's no need for me to carry all that weight anymore. Uh, so let me get the clicker. It's funny because I play football in front of like 90,000, 100,000 people like every week, but I always get a little nervous speaking in front of like, this is a pretty decent crowd, but I always get a little bit nervous when I speak. So um, today I'm going to give my presentation. The name of my presentation is called Oppression in the Food System. And I'll get into that later, but I'm gonna just give a little intro as to who I am and let me figure out this clicker real quick. So that's me, David Carter. I played for the Arizona Cardinals. That's where, you know, I, I came, I was, I went to UCLA. I played football there, grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, I, me and my brother both grew up playing football together. Um, he ended up going to the NFL also, playing, went to the Steelers. And, but this is about me. So, the, <laughs> but uh, I played for the Arizona Cardinals. I played as a nose tackle. Uh, played for the Dallas Cowboys and a few other teams like the Raiders and the, uh, the Bears as a nose tackle. And it's just, you know, telling my, hold on. All right, I'm gonna go back. All right, so I started out eating meat like everybody else. Like I told you, my brother and I grew up playing sports. Um, so we were always the bigger kids and that has a lot to do with my family only, you know, and how we grew up. My family's from the South. My family owned a barbecue restaurant in Los Angeles, California called Leo's Barbecue, which is a pretty famous vegan, I mean, vegan, not vegan, sorry, not at all. Uh, a, a pretty famous barbecue restaurant and like Little Richard used to go there, Red Fox, Michael Jackson. It was pretty cool, you know, seeing all those kids. I mean, seeing all those people while I was a kid growing up coming to my grandparents' restaurant. But, you know, living in that, growing up in that, I ate all of that food. I was eating like ribs and, you know, you know, barbecue pork sandwiches and beef sandwiches and stuff like that. I remember telling people growing up that I was allergic to vegetables. Like, oh, I'm allergic to vegetables. I'm not gonna eat that. What is that? You gotta put some cheese on my broccoli first before I eat it. That was what my grandfather really had to do to get me to eat, veg to eat vegetables. And um, eating, you know, eating, beef and all, and all the meat, the animal products, the milkshakes and all that stuff. It got me big, it got me to be the size that I needed to be to play in the NFL, but it, it, de it definitely didn't, it, it wasn't good in the long run. Um, I was 23, 24, 20, like in between that age, 24, 26 years of age as a NFL player, a nose tackle in the NFL, working out hours on the day, you know, the, the people looking at the world, looking at NFL players and myself as, you know, physical specimens. Like, look at these guys, they're so big and so strong. Like, uh, you know, they're pillars of health. That's what I wanna be when I grow up, dad. You know, like I wanna be just like this guy. But the most people don't know that NFL players are not healthy. The, the average age of death for football players is 56 years of age, and that's from a NIOSH, a, a, a National Institute of Health and Sci Science and Health study, and the NFL, they partnered together, did a study, and they found out that the average age of death for NFL players, like I said, is 56 years of age. So how are we pillars of health, but we're dying at 56? And it's like, that doesn't add up. And what the players are dying from is like, yeah, there's issues with C, like uh, players are the CTE, but that's so small on the scale of what the real problem is. You know, it's an issue, but it's not the biggest problem is that the players are dying of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, obesity. And after they retire, you know, most players, let me go away from this speaker. After they retire, most players are, you know, when you're, when you're playing, you're, you're working out all day, every day. You know, you're working out three hours a day. You got practice for three hours on top of that. Then you go home or you go to your other trainer afterwards and you work out for another two hours and that's one day, you know? And so, but then when you're done, you know, you're not, there's no way in hell you're gonna work out that much. You're not getting paid to work out anymore. So you're like, forget it. I ain't working out as much as I was, you know? So you adopt a sedentary lifestyle and then, but you continue eating the way that you were and the way that now let me get on that the way that we ate in the end that we ate in the nfl and like people eat in the nfl is like you eat what you can get your hands like you eat with 
Well, first of all, let's say the teams, they give you, a perfect example is they give you church's chicken, uh, three pieces and a biscuit right before you hop on the plane to go play a game. Or they'll feed you, you know, all they're feeding you all these fattening foods. Or after practice, you know, we don't want to eat the food that they got because they don't, they don't, they don't taste good. They don't season it right. So we go to like, you know, uh, uh, In and Out Burger, which is a fast food burger spot, which is. Like cleaner than Jack in the Box or, or, Big, or Burger King or McDonald's. So we were like, oh, that's the clean, but we're gonna eat there, it's healthier. You know, their fries are healthier than McDonald's fries because they're real potatoes. And we'll get like four double-doubles or five double-doubles and we'll eat that after practice. And we'll be like, all right, cool, that's it. And then, we, and then you know, and, that, and, we're tr and not to mention, we're trying to keep our weight up because I play nose tackle and as, as a nose tackle, let me give you an example. As a nose tackle, you have to be 300 pounds or heavier. And if you're, because if you're not, you know, a nose tackle, you're going up against two offensive linemen who are 300 pounds, 300, in between 300 and 340 pounds, right? And so imagine going up against those guys. If you're not at least 300 pounds, they're just going to pick your ass up and move you out the way and then run the ball, the touchdown. You know, that's what happens. So guys are trying to keep their weight on. And so anyways, as a result, you know, as a result of eating like that and just trying to keep their weight on and eating all day, all night, drinking milkshakes in the middle of the night to, uh, to, to, to put the weight on, I started suffering from, I started suffering from Ill, like little ailments, like, not little, like what I like to call old man illnesses, old man diseases, which was the tendonitis, felt like early onset arthritis. I had high blood pressure. They had me on high blood pressure medication. Uh, I was having muscle fatigue because it was poor circulation. You know, when you have all that stuff, you know, uh, shooting pains up and, up and down my arms and then, uh, they say numbness in my hands. I had an injury where my hand, they had me, the, the team put me with a, a big plastic brace on my hand to prevent my hand from hyperextending because I had nerve damage in my right hand to where I couldn't feel half of my hand, like my middle finger, ring finger, pinky finger. The only fingers I had use of were my index and my thumb finger. And they still there like, here, just put this brace on, go back out there and play. Uh, all right, and so like, but then to, to help with that, all of that stuff, they gave me a long list of, of medications. You know, like I said, the painkillers, the anti-inflammatories, the uh, high blood pressure medication. And I was in my early 20s playing in the NFL thinking I'm like, I'm strong. I'm like, I'm a fit athlete. I'm good, I'm, I'm gonna live forever. I have this in, invincible mentality. So, you know, but, and I was listening to these doctors and, and I was and like, you know, taking what they were giving me and I was like, man, this is just not working. The pain kept getting worse and kept getting worse. And I started trying like things to like, uh, you know, uh, trying to eat, trying to what I thought was cleaner, adding vegetables, cutting the fat off of the meat, like trying to eat lean meat and all that stuff. Cause that's what the doctors are. You know, you gotta eat healthier, you gotta eat cleaner, this, that, and the other. But they would never tell you how to do it because they themselves, you can look at them, they don't look healthy than damn selves. Obviously they're not eating right. So it was like, you know, I was like, man, this just isn't right. It isn't right. I had to, and not, and not to mention the team doctors, uh, they don't work for you. They're not here to get you healthy. They're, they work for the team. Their job is to just get you back on the field. That's why their name is Team Doctors, because they do, they're a doctor hired by the team just to provide you, or, or you know, medication, drugs, opioids. Uh, that's another thing. The highest, uh, one, not after the, after uh, illnesses, uh, food illnesses being the leading cause of death in NFL players, opioids is a follow, is a follow up leading cause of death in football players because they are, they're suffering from the same illnesses, the tendonitis, the joint pain. They're trying to recover from injuries and all this, that, and the other. And they're taking these opioids because the they go in there and be like, yo, man, my back hurts. All right, here goes some Vicodin. All right, here goes some Celebrex. And so they're, take, they're taking this stuff and then after they're done playing and they retire, they still hurt. They still, their back still messed up, their knees still messed up, and they trying to get out of bed in the morning and just to get the day started, they got a pop of Vicodin. They got a pop of Celebrex. And that's why another leading cause of death for football players after retirement is opioid abuse, opioid usage, an overdose, and things like that. The side effects that the opioids have on their body. And so, back to the doctors. 
right? And so this is a, a good slide. I love this slide because I was, you know, taking the advice of my doctors like, all right, so you got to ice it. This is tendonitis. Put some ice on it. Here, take this. The, infl the inflammation will go down if you take this Celebrex and you'll be fine. You know, or they kept giving me these Band-Aids. And then I started, once I, I started uh, wising up a little bit towards my journey to the plant-based diet, you know, my, my ex-wife, she was vegan at the time. And she's vegan still. But she was like, you know, you should try to eat vegan. I'm like, nah, I'm good. Where am I going to get my protein from? You want me to be skinny? I'm trying to stay employed. You want me to lose my job? What are you talking about? I'm not going to be vegan. But the, it started making more sense to me once, you know, I was like, there's no way that I can sustain. I can't, I can't stay healthy like this. I'm only 23 suffering from these old man illnesses and the doctors are over here telling me that I'm gonna be okay. And along my journey, I, I realized as you know, doctors, uh, I watched the documentary Forks Over Knives and I'm gonna reach back on it, but I'm gonna tap into it real quick here, is that doctors, they don't, they don't, they go to school for 10 years and the whole time when they're in school, they only get, they get less than 20 hours of, of nutritional study. And if we are what we eat, then, you know, then they should definitely have more time on the books when it comes to nutrition and what we eat, right? Because I'm just saying, like, you drink alcohol, you get drunk. You know, one plus one equals two. You know, you drink, if you, you drink water, you gotta go pee. You gotta, you gotta drink a lot of, you know, you guys get the point. But anyways, so, like I was saying, all right, so, and back to the doctors, they're not really, they don't really understand, like I was saying, doctors, they go to school for 10 years and they, they, uh, they only get, they get less than a few hours of nutritional study. And I realized when I was playing that, you know, the doctors, they're not necessarily here for us. They're here for whatever corporation that they work for and like the team doctors, you know? And it, it made me realize it was like the food, the food related illnesses, like and the food related illnesses that the players are dying of that they kept giving us band-aids for, which is the high blood pressure medication, telling us to eat cleaner, not necessarily telling us what to eat, but just telling us to eat cleaner. And, and, and you know, it's giving us very vague answers around our health and our livelihood and how we're supposed to survive out here and keep our jobs because in the NFL, your body is your career. You can only play as long as, as long as you're able, as long as you're healthy, as long as you're able. But anyways, leading cause of death for NFL players, these are all food-related illnesses, you know? Uh, can't, and these are, and, and just by chance, these are not just for the leading cause of death for football players, but the leading cause of death for the general population, you know? And these are the, this is the CDC. I really don't trust the CDC, but this is a good list anyway. So the CDC's list of top 10 killers in the world, cancer, uh, chronic lower respiratory disease, stroke, heart attack, diabetes. These are, um, these are their top 10 list of killers in the world along with suicide and uh, all kind of other stuff, you know? And it's like, these are food related illnesses. And it's like, why are we not paying more attention to these food related illnesses and really, uh, and really unpacking what it is and how and, and why we're suffering from it? And you know, this is causing more death than war, easy. You know, so we really have to pay attention to what it is and, and, move, and moving forward in our lives. So, oh. so disease, I'm trying to like, we only have like 45 minutes, so I'm trying to be like conscious of the time here. So, uh, and then we're breaking down, the, like I was talking about disease and the players, we're suffering from these diseases, right? These, these food related diseases and it's hard for us to get up in the morning. We gotta take these Celebrex and these Vicodin just to get rid of the pain as our bodies are all jacked up from the, from the game itself. But the real problem is what we're feeding ourselves, the fuel that we're feeding ourselves and, and it's causing us not to, to function properly. So when you go back, and like I said, the leading cause of death we have right here, I'll go back, is cancer or another one, I'm gonna just take heart disease, right? Heart disease. Heart disease is, I mean, you can define any word by hyphenating it. So we're gonna hyphenate disease, dis-ease. Your body is a machine. If you take the heart, oh man, slides are messed up. If you take the heart, the heart is just a muscle. And you take fat and you, you eat like animal fat and it goes and that's what surrounds the heart and, and the, the heart's trying to pump and the heart's pumping. The animal fat goes in there and it surrounds the heart like a bunch of rubber bands. And the heart's just the muscle, right? And you're pumping, and so I'm gonna take like, it's like, is it, you're pumping like this, this is the heart. 
you put a five pound weight in your hand, that's like those, the fat surrounding your heart. And it's like, I don't care how strong you are, your, your, your heart can only pump so many times with that weight in your hand or that weight surrounding your heart. That's what makes it hard for your heart to function with ease, right? That's heart disease. You are, cause, you are putting these problems on your heart, this weight on your heart, causing your heart not to function properly. Or you have atherosclerosis, where you have cholesterol or inflammation of the arteries. The cholesterol inflames the arteries and, prevent, and clogs the arteries up and prevents your heart from pumping blood through the arteries to the rest of your body with ease. Hence the term heart dis-ease. The, we, these terms are defining what it is that we're dealing with, right? And, and so it's important for us to know these things moving forward. Same thing with diabetes. It's the same thing. Fat goes into, we, we take in fat. Uh, well, we, that's another, so I'll get into that later. That's a, so quick fact. So this is, that's really, that's real quick why I went vegan. Uh, and I'm gonna briefly touch on why it would really made me go vegan. I watched the documentary Forks Over Knives and it really helped me to really identify what it is that I was dealing with as far as the tendinitis and the, the nerve issue, the nerve damage and the inflammation in my body that was causing me to have these old man illnesses in the NFL in my early 20s. That just doesn't make sense, you know? And it was the part where they were saying how milk when you, when you take in animal products into your body, it, it sends your body into an instant state of inflammation. And then we can go back to hyphenating words or defining the words or the terms that we're using to describe these illnesses. Uh, tendinitis, when you break down the word, tendon means joint and itis is Latin for inflammation. And I was telling you that in the documentary, Forks Over Knives, they tell you how animal products, as soon as you ingest them, send your body into an instant state of inflammation. Your body's inflamed for four hours after you have that piece of cheese. Then you go for lunch, and then, or that cheese and eggs and bacon for breakfast. Then you go for lunch, and then you have uh, you know, chicken sandwich or a tuna sandwich or whatever you're gonna have, and then that sends your body into another state of inflammation. Then you have dinner, and that's got chicken or steak or whatever it is you're gonna eat. That sends your body into another state of inflammation. And then dessert, ice cream, you inflame the whole entire day. And so your body is not functioning with ease. And that's why we're having all of these diseases and we're taking all these painkillers, which are just anti-inflammatory, ibuprofen, Celebrex, Naproxen, all of these are anti-inflammatories to temporarily uh, release the, inf the, to reduce the inflammation in your body so your, bo so your nerves are not compressed and so that you won't feel that pain at that moment of time. We don't need to be taking a leave all damn so, day. Like I was saying, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. And so we're take, we eat animal products and we're, we're eating these, we're eating chicken and all this stuff or beef. And we're like, oh, I, the doctor told me I need to eat clean. I need to cut the, I need to like lean the meat up, you know, so I'm gonna cut the fat off the top of the steak and I'm gonna cook it and then, you know, act like, I, and then it's like, oh, I'm eating healthy, I'm eating clean. No, you're not. There's fat marbled inside the meat, inside that chicken, inside that steak, but you're not cutting out. And then you're cooking and it drips off, but there's still fat inside of it. And our, we take this fat in and our bodies don't know what to do with it. It just sits on our body. Our bodies don't have the enzymes to break down the fat. And then our body's looking at this animal fat, this fat from another animal that, you know, that, that we're taking into our bodies. And it just looks at it and goes, I don't know what to do with it. So I'm going to stick it right here in your love handle. I'm going to stick it right here in your butt and your hip, whatever, where you don't want it, right? And it's like, why are we, why are we continuing to go down this path? It's like the, the, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. Like I said, you drink alcohol, you get drunk. That's just what it is. One plus one equals two. And so like here goes a, here goes a uh, picture of what I was talking about with the heart disease. You know, the fat surrounding your heart, preventing your heart, which is just a muscle, to pump blood through the rest of your body and giving you heart disease. And here goes another one, which is another disease that a lot of y'all don't want to talk about, but it's real. You need to talk about it. It's going to help your marriages, relationships, all this, that, and the other. I'm just trying to help y'all out a little bit. But erectile dysfunction is the same thing as heart attack. It's the same thing as stroke, heart disease. It's the same thing as stroke. The smallest artery in the human body is the one going to the reproductive organs, male or female, right? So the first artery to get clogged in the human body is the one going to your reproductive organs. That's why men are always have uh, erectile dysfunction and erectile dysfunction is a precursor to heart disease. Now we could take a look at the, the, 
the medications the, that are, or the band-aids I like to call them, like Cialis or Viagra or whatever, these are called, uh, these, are, these medicines are, um, they're created to expand the arteries and, and make the blood flow through the body quicker. And that's, uh, and flow, uh, flow through the body for that four hours. And these, uh, they're, and they're called biodacillators. And the reason, and these were created in the lab, obviously, uh, but they were, create, they were originally created for heart patients right to expand the arteries so they can get blood through the rest of their body because their arteries are clogged with cholesterol but when they did the test trials and they were handing them out to all the people they found out that the people were walking around they were like oh shoot 30 minutes later they're walking around just like night all strong right they're like oh shit we're gonna sell this so they saw so we were like so that's like sex sales so they sold it they're like yo we got this pill this magical blue pill and you know but really it's originally for heart patients so basic so erectile dysfunction is another disease that your body is not functioning with ease you're not getting proper blood flow to your to your your nether regions or 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 another thing is that another women are going into menopause early because they're not getting proper blood flow to their to their reproductive organs so that's another reason why that's why they're coming up with this women's viagra it's the same thing it's the same thing. So it's important that we know that. We have to read between the lines. We have to be able to hyphenate the words and define the illnesses that we're dealing with so we know what to do. You know, knowledge is power. All right. So, and then not to mention, we have to take into consideration what we're putting into our bodies, right? So uh, these are hot dogs, obviously. So according to the World, Horth, uh, World, blah, 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 World Health Organization, Three hot dogs is equivalent to smoking a pack of cigarettes. So I know growing up, I grew up in the hood, I grew up in South Central LA, and that's all we, we were, that's what we would eat for breakfast. They would chop up hot dogs and fry them up and cook some eggs, and that was what we would have for breakfast. I remember, that's so I'm just thinking, I just think back and like, damn, how many cigarettes did I smoke growing up, you know? Because that's what, that's what we were eating. And that's, not, and that's what I'm saying. You have to be careful what it is that you're feeding your family members, what you're feeding yourself. Awareness is key. Awareness is everything. And so, uh, and like, and then we're back to what I was saying, according to the National Institute of Diabetes, like, these are, these are what our kids are eating, all these processed foods that go through whatever the process is. We don't even know. It's crazy what it goes through. And we're feeding this to our kids, and it has their high in levels of saturated fat and trans fats and all of these things. And it's sending our kids into to deal with diabetes. And we think that, I know in black, in black culture, we consider, we call diabetes the sugars, right? That's just what it is in the South. Oh, your sugar, your blood sugar level is high, baby. You gotta, you know, where's your ticket insulin? But diabetes is not caused by, um, by sugar. It's caused by saturated fat. Saturated fat is what's found in meat products and processed oils that, uh, that seize at room temperature, like Crisco, which is conveniently found in the hood. And, you know, the saturated fat goes down to your pancreas, where your pancreas is where your, or your beta cells are, and your beta cells... Hello? Okay. Your beta cells create insulin in your body and, and balance out your blood sugar levels. So we call it the sugars, and we're, and we're avoiding foods that have all this sugar and everything, but that's not what it is. That's the problem. That's not the culprit. It's the animal product. Sugar's in everything. Sugar's in, in fruits and vegetables and broccoli. It's in rice. Rice is almost it's all sugar. So it's like, you know, you, you have to know what it is that we're dealing with because if this is a serious problem when one in three children are, are dealing with diabetes at an early age. And we're talking about, we got to get the sugars out of school. Yeah, we got to get the sugars out of the school, but we also got to get these highly processed animal products out of the school because these are the real cause of the problems, right? Uh, but one in three children are considered obese, and these are the these animal products that people are eating. Like I said, you are what you eat. You're eating, you're eating the animal fats, and then we're trying to work out, work all hard and stuff, hit the gym, doing the squats and everything, and like, I don't know what's going on. I'm, I'm trying to work out. I'm eating lean meats. And it's like, really, you're putting the fat of another animal inside of you and wondering why you can't shed the weight, why you're wondering why you don't, you're not where you want to be and, and, and physically. It's just, like I said, one plus one equals two. And so, uh, next stage. So, 
this is what the speeches are about. This is, well, that was a, that's like why I went vegan and the things that I learned along my journey to help solidify my journey into veganism or plant-based lifestyle and continue. But this is really why. So I grew up, I, I used to give that same speech that I was just giving to you guys or all over. And like I said, I grew up in South Central and sort of felt kind of disjointed, especially when somebody stood up and was like, yo man, you know, this is all good and everything, but I live in the hood. I live in what they call food desert. And you know, we can't, I mean, it's all good and everything. I want to eat healthy, but we can't eat healthy because we don't have this food in our community. So what am I supposed to do? You got a, you got something, you got an idea, something? Can you enlighten me on that? And so that sent me back to the drawing board and really unpack what food oppression is. And food oppression is, is really, uh, you guys can read it, a structural perpetuation of race and class based on health crisis implemented through targeted marketing, infiltration into schools, government subsidies, and federal food policy. Systemic food oppression, how food is allocated and, and how resources are allocated, not just food, but resources in general. And food is just one portion of that. And so it's, a, and, and it's important for us to know. And so uh, the food desert, food deserts, like I tell you, food deserts are basically where there are no grocery stores within a three mile radius. You know, that's what a grocery store miles doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot when you don't have a car, when you're working three jobs and you don't have the time or you have, a, you know, a bunch of kids. Imagine trying to get to the grocery store three miles, two miles, even one mile away with no car or trying to take the bus. And then you get on you and, you know, and trying to get back home. And another thing is, it's, there's no farmers markets, there's no anything like that. And you're surrounded by the, and your only surrounding is the junk food restaurants like uh, McDonald's, Burger King, KFC, these fast food restaurants that are conveniently placed in these communities with no grocery stores. And, and these are the, and it's funny because these fast food restaurants are the highest sellers and purchasers of animal products in the world. So it's important for us to know that. And a lot of people, so these food deserts, I will go back, these food deserts, or you know, the lack of healthy foods in our communities, these food deserts are, the, the term food, food desert, and we act like, you know, like people like to say, oh, what do we do about these food deserts? I don't know what to do about these food deserts. Like, they're so, it's so sad that these food deserts are happening, these people can't eat. We can't get the food there to these communities. That's a damn lie. It's like, like, where do you think these food deserts? First of all, the term desert is wrong. Food desert is wrong. Desert is something that God created where there's no, or whoever you believe in created. There, there's no water there. There's no plants, no green life growing. It's a barren land, right? These food deserts are systems that are created. They're system, uh, you know, geographically placed. We're not gonna put grocery stores in this community, but we're gonna put five grocery stores in this community right here. Like, somebody created that. Somebody decided, you know what, that's what we're gonna do. And we're about to find out why. So our food system is created, it, our, our, I don't know, a lot of you guys are not familiar with, probably not familiar with Jim Crow law, but Jim Crow law is basically where they were like, you know, whites only restrooms, blacks only restrooms, blacks only schools, white schools only. You know, they had a thing called sundown laws where, where black people were not allowed to come, people of color were not allowed to come out when the sun comes down or they can get lynched or put in jail or whatever, something like that. This, is, this system of, of oppression a suppression uh, is what our food system is based off of and and so and I'm gonna tell you about this zoning laws uh, these are this is what the our, these are our food system is based off of zoning laws this is what it's called now red zoning laws but these are used to to limit what they do with these zoning laws is they're in there they break our food system up into tiers tier Four is, or tier one is like the really nice area, like the area that we're in right now, where there are no fast food restaurants. If there are, there's like one, right? That's tier one. And what they do with tier one, why they keep it like that is because they say, and it's written in the books, we want to preserve the character of the community, right? We want to keep the riffraff and the plight out of the community. And I'm gonna break that word down, I'm gonna unpack that word plight. 
later. And so they, so that's what they say. And then tier two, they have, you know, they up the fast food restaurant just a little, they allow a little bit more fast food restaurants in tier two. Tier three, a little bit more fast food restaurants. Tier four, unlimited fast food restaurants. And so well, this is how our food system goes. But the way this, and this, but this actually goes back to, uh, like I said, the, the red zoning laws are made up of Jim Crow laws. So originally our red zoning laws were called Negro zoning laws in 1910. And it was started in Baltimore and they used it to promote, uh, they used it to, to separate the communities of color, not just by the people, but resources, right? So, in the, and, and back in the day, it wasn't you know, the whole four tiers, but it was just like the communities of color, the ghettos, and they would, they would have no food or very little food or all the bad food would get funneled into that community. And then they would have, they were separated with industrial buildings, like the work and all the, all the work buildings. And then they would have the well-to-do affluent areas, white areas over here, and they would have an abundance of food, fast food rest, or not that, um, the farmers markets, the grocery stores, all of this, very similar to what we have today. But these were called Negro zoning laws. And they were, and, and then in 1917, uh, it was deemed unconstitutional. So they were like, oh, the name is racist, so we have to change it. And so they changed it to racial zoning laws. Like that was any better. And then in 1930, they did it again. They were like, oh, this is unconstitutional. We need to change the name of this. So they changed it to red zoning laws. So basically all they did was rebrand it, right? Rebrand these laws of oppression that they, that these laws that stem from oppression, just rebranded it, made it and painted it, put some sugar on it, made it look good. And was like, we're gonna put it right back out there again, repurpose it. And they never really changed anything about the law. The only thing that they changed about it really, other than the title, was the subtext, where it said black, Asian, Native American, and they substituted that with the word blight, which I was talking about earlier. And when you define blight, and blight just means infestation, mildew, and mold. So they're referring to people of color as infestation, mildew, and mold. And that's where they get that. We want to preserve the character of our community and keep out the riffraff. That's what they were referring to. They were talking about people of color. So, yeah. And so now we have to get into, uh, so yeah, that was they talking about that. And then how fast food is target. Now we have to, now looking today in 2018, and I like to think about, and, and just leading up to 2018, how we got here, while we still have these food deserts and all of this stuff. Our food deserts, these are, I like to say like, Okay, the fast food, these fast food companies are making a killing, literally and figuratively, by marketing to communities of color. And I'm gonna tell you how. So, these, so the fast food companies, they view teens uh, and uh, teens of color as trendsetters. And they, can, they look at them as tremendous band ambassadors, and they exploit the, uh, the celebrities, like they'll have Nelly up there with the milk mustache, and like, you know, got milk, or, you know, and then you always see it, like look at McDonald's, look at Burger King, you can see how they, how they market directly to these people, to, to the people of color. And in targeted marketing, that's something I'm gonna break down, and, and I already told you about zoning laws. So here goes an example right here of the general marketing of McDonald's. You know, it's simple, it's plain, it's not targeted at anybody. You know, it's still not healthy. It's still like, you know, it's bad. It's not good. And then you got Colonel Sanders down here at the bottom on the beach and making it look all whatever. But this is just basically what general marketing is. Now, here goes the targeted marketing. Now, targeted marketing, you know, use Hello? All right. They'll use celebrities of color in, in, in all of their marketing. Like I said, Nelly, or, or they'll, we can look at how, we, how uh, at all the, uh, the, the, the people of color events, like the gospel events, or the drumline events, the, the HBCU events, they're all sponsored by McDonald's, by, uh, by Pepsi-Cola, or, or one of these companies that are fast food companies that are very bad for our health. You know, and then when you look at it, you look at the, the uh, brick and mortars, where are all the, the uh, that's the later, I'll get into that later. But you see how, how, how they use, how they're using it. And then when, let's see, there's a study, uh, uh, 
it was a Yale Rudd study, but now it's a Yukon Rudd study. They switched schools and it shows that Pepsi Cola and these fast food restaurants, they announced that 86% of their net profit from the year 2015 to the year 2020 is gonna come from marketing to youth of color. Once again, because they view them as trendsetters. And, and like, I mean, we can look at it, hip hop, dance, you can look at even big butts. You got people getting big, you know, butt shots, and that's a that's a whole thing. Big lips, and getting injections in their lips, and you know all of these things. Braids, you know, they're called cornrows, and now they're called box braids. It's a whole thing. So, but anyways, um, and this is what I was talking about. McDonald's, for example, the targeted marketing. Um, McDonald's is, you know, they have websites, and their websites they break it down per race by by race. So they have one called My Inspiration. If that's not racist, I don't know what it is. You know, that's just crazy. Or me and Kanta and, and 365 Black, right? And 365 Black, all these websites, what they do is they take a, do, a new celebrity of color and put them on the website every single day to promote their uh, website and give them money. Like, oh, McDonald's, they had Keith Sweat on there talking about uh, Chicken McNuggets uh, changed my life. Like, tell me how Chicken McNuggets changed your life, bro, please. I don't it's just, but anyways, so, and like I said, these, these companies, they sponsor these, these events. You got the BET Awards sponsored by McDonald's, the gospel events sponsored by McDonald's and Pepsi-Cola, sporting events, the HBCU events and all of these things, the McDonald's basketball tournaments, you know, they're sponsoring all these events of color. And this is how, you know, back, like I was saying, for, uh, marketing to the trendsetters and, and, and everybody like that to make their 85% to, to reach their goal of making 85% of their profit from marketing the youth of color, the trendsetters. And so, uh, yeah, so, so, and this is another thing is like, not only are they doing it on like, just like, you know, the physical marketing and, and doing it or at our events and everything like that, it's also on television. 85 85 to 86% of the commercials on BET and Telemundo are fast food commercials and and sugary sugary drink commercials medicine commercials and and big pharma commercials you know it's like these are these are things it's like this is targeted marketing at its finest where they're infiltrating every aspect of entertainment education uh, and all of these things where people are watching this watching television and you know we're thinking we're just getting entertainment but we're getting inundated with all of this these fast food marketing and the sugary drink marketing and all of that stuff and 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 it causes an effect because when you go into the grocery store you're gonna get the first thing that you see or when you get hungry you're like man i'm hungry you're not thinking about it but you're thinking about you're not really thinking about why you're thinking about mcdonald's or why you're hungry for mcdonald's it's just because you saw all those red bright yellow and pink colors that they were pop flashing in your face in the commercial and then you go right to mcdonald's not to mention it's, it's conveniently located for you if you're a person of color and you live in the hood or you live in a food desert because there are no grocery stores, but there's an abundance of fast food restaurants in your community. I know in the food desert where I grew up, you know, we didn't have no grocery store, but we had at the corner, we had Burger King, McDonald's, Subway, Jack, uh, Taco Bell, Jack in the Box. This is all on one corner, one corner. But we, but for some reason, they, they give you all mad, like crazy excuses why we can't get a grocery store in there. And oh, I forgot to tell you how that happened. And this is crazy. So Nick's, uh, uh, so back in the day, so in the 60s, after the Watts riots and the riots, had, I mean, not, yeah, the riots, and they span across the country in the 60s, the president was like, Nixon, he was like, yo, these people, they need food, they need jobs, right? And so what he did was he gave fast food restaurants franchise loans and fast food restaurants and liquor stores a series of franchise loans. It was like $118 million of franchise loans that he gave them to, 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 to go ahead and put your restaurants in these communities. And that's what they did. And that's why we have all these fast food restaurants and liquor stores in the communities of color today is because these are government funded, you know, subsidized, you know, like, but they wouldn't consider, they don't consider grocery stores to be chains. So they are, you know, franchises. So they're like, we're not going to give them, uh, we're not going to give them loans. We're just going to give these grocery stores and liquor stores loans, uh, franchise loans. And that's what they did. And, and it, that is like, you think about it, 
that's no different than Christopher Columbus coming in and giving people, oh, we're going to give you blankets. You know, that was like Nixon's uh, new deal or a good deal or whatever. Like, you know, we want to give you this deal. But, you know, and, and Christopher Columbus is coming in giving blankets with measles on it. That fast food is killing people just like those measles were in the blankets. It's no different. It's the same thing. So, uh, yeah, and this is why it's like, this is like systemic, it's like systemic genocide. It's carefully placed, right? So people of color, you could, people of color are majority lactose intolerant. So why is it that, you know, this is like, we, we look at it right here, you know, you can look at this East Asian population, 90 to 100% lactose intolerant. Indigenous Americans, like Native Americans, 80 to 100% lactose intolerant. Central Asian, 80 to 100% lactose intolerant. African, Indian, 75, all the groups of color are 75 to 100% lactose intolerant. And now we have to go back to Christopher Columbus and I'll tell you about, is that the next, or you go, but when you go all the way to the other side of it and you have, you know, all the European, everybody, 17% lactose intolerance. It's a real drastic difference of people who are lactose intolerant. And this is the study, if you want to look it up, this is the study by Dr. Milton Mills of the Physicians Committee of Responsible Medicine. You can go look it up yourself. He's a vegan doctor himself. Great guy. So you can look that up. And then... Uh, and and these and, and like I told you that animal products, animal products are, are uh, you know they cause all. Or, let me go back. So this is the leading people of color are lactose intolerant. Sorry, just messed up a little bit. Leading people of color are lactose intolerant, and we're not made to drink animal pro drink milk and dairy and all that stuff. But then when you look at things like the milk law, which started in Baltimore, it was it was started in communities of color where they were giving people of color. They were like, oh, we need a, we need a, uh, they, they, they put it on the war at the time and was like, we're too, we're, we're not fit to fight. We're not strong enough. So what they were like, we need to, we need to fatten our people up. We need to get them bigger. We need to get them stronger so we can go fight in the war. They started in Baltimore and started in communities of color and still, and, and they were forcing kids to take milk on their trays and they still do this today but they do it in majority of communities of color where they're you know forcing milk products on kids and things like that and you look at the, the schools in communities of color and they're getting all these like the the chicken nuggets and the hot dogs and the super processed foods is damn near prison food and the kids are are one in three diabetic we can go back to that and it's like a whole thing and and you look at just I don't want to even get into that. I don't have enough time for that. But it's, it's like something that we have to take into consideration that, you know, people of color are not designed to eat animal products. And if you look at our history, that was something that we didn't, uh, we didn't eat before Christopher Columbus came in and our colonization happened. And I'm going to get into that. And then we can look at Mexico. Mexico, the leading cause of death in Mexico is heart disease and like coronary artery disease because they're, before Christopher Columbus, Hold on, is that the next slide? There you go. Thank you. Before Christopher Columbus came to the Americas, there were no cows, there were no pigs, there were no chickens here in the Americas. So people of color, and, and the, like in Mexico, they didn't have any, any milk or dairy products or any animal products in their food. I went and I spoke, or I speak all the time in Mexico, and I spoke in Mayan country, and they were showing me how to make tacos, the original tacos. And they were just the corn tortilla shells. They told me how, what those were before colonization. And tacos were just potatoes and peppers before Christopher Columbus brought cows and chickens and everything to the Americas. They didn't have any of that. And so, but now you see Mexican food today and it's just loaded with cheese and, you know, queso and fajita, like, you know, you know, steak fajitas and all this, that, and the other. You got cheese dripping from everywhere. You got sour cream. That's not even a Mexican food, but it, it's considered part of Mexican food now for people who are unaware. But that was, that's not Mexican food at all. How can it be Mexican food when they didn't have um, uh, cows here to milk? when they were making Mexican, when the origination of Mexican food. So we have to look and see how colonization played a role in the food. So that's for, that's for Mexican food and the, the Mexican population. But then we have soul food, right? And how colonization played a role in soul food. Soul food is the same, is, is basically, I call it slave food because it's not feeding nobody's soul. It's killing people, right? right? <laughs> 
because in slave food, soul food, slave food was was brought was given to us during slavery times when the slaves didn't have anything but the scraps to eat because that's what the slave masters were giving them. Here, 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 here you go. Take this pig's feet or these pig intestines or these pig nose, pig ears, pig skin. You know, cow's foot, ox tails. These are all like, like. Oh, these are like delicatessens and soul food. Like this is what people eat, right? But those don't sound you know, like, that don't sound tasty to me. Pig's feet? What? Seriously? It's, but these are things that we adopted and we, and due to necessity, we figured out and, you know, and we needed our, our little babies and every, everybody and our family members to eat. So we figured out how to make that shit taste good. All right, this is what we got. I'm gonna put a whole bunch of seasoning on it. I'm gonna deep fry it. I'm gonna put a bunch of sugar on it. I'm gonna cook it for 14 hours so it tenderizes, you know? And that's how we got soul food, right? But like I said, soul food is slave food. And, and we see today, like, because before, like when we were, when slavery was in play, we were out there for 17 hours a day, eat, go to sleep, wake up, do the same thing again. We were strong, we were, you know, not, no, not very many people were overweight, you know, if any. And now you look at today, not too much longer, not too much later, you know, we're 60% of our, of the 60 to almost 70% of people of color are overweight and, die, and, 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 and dying of diseases like heart disease, stroke, diabetes, when these things were not even, you know, there wasn't even an issue back in the day. And then same thing in the, Mex in, the, in the Latino and the Mexican population, you know, the leading cause of death in Mexico is diabetes. It's like, and that's because, you know, their food has dramatically changed in time, over time. And then it's like, you see like soul food and slave food, we take this, we, it, you know, we adopted soul food, you know, because we took it in, we changed it up, and we were proud of what we created out of, out of these, these moments of strife. And, but, and we turned it into a tradition. But not all traditions are good traditions because technically slavery is considered a tradition. So we have to really define, go back again and define these terms that we're using, that we're just throwing around and using, you know? So, yeah, here we go. Like, yeah, soul food's been killing black folks in 1620. That's real. Like, it's, that's just what it is. Uh, and so, um, Yes, so back to it, it's like lactose intolerance, where, and you can see that people of color, like I said, are 75 to 100% lactose intolerant, and it's killing us, dying of diabetes, stroke, and all that stuff. And then, you know, don't allow yourselves, be aware of what's going on. Be aware of how they're selling things, selling things to you, selling, selling these meals to your kids. They got knee-high advertisements. You know, they're not made for you to see. You're not looking down there to look at Ronald McDonald and the Cookie Monster, or all these people, Cookie Monster, whoever these characters, caricatures are to sell to you. They're not selling to you. They're selling to your kids. Be aware of what you're allowing and, you know, you're feeding to your children. Be aware of that. These McDonald's products, you can let it sit in on the, let it sit outside for 14, for 14 years and it's gonna look the same. That is not food. That is a product. That is something that somebody created. So please be aware of what it is that you're eating. And then a lot of people ask me all the time, like when I went vegan or plant-based, I like the word plant-based, it's nicer, all right? So when I went plant-based, what, what did you eat? Nachos, taquitos, Ham and hamburgers, not Mexican food, uh, pizza, all of this stuff. And I just basically veganized it. I tricked my taste buds. I was like, I'm gonna eat healthy. I'm just gonna remove the meat and make it healthy. So I just converted my current menu into a plant-based menu. Uh, like I was saying, the hamburgers and uh, all of these things. So um, I would like to thank all of you all for coming out today. And thank you for coming out to the Cleveland Veg Fest. They did an amazing job this year. So, thank you. If you guys want to follow me, you can follow me at I am David H. Carter uh, on Instagram. And uh, my website is I am David H. Carter .com. And uh, you guys enjoy yourselves. Eat all this good food up. And I hope you learned something today. Appreciate it.